In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. Welcome to the Low Impact TV podcast. I'm talking today with Marcus Saul of Island Power, an, an energy company doing incredible things that could be world changing, I think, in terms of building a new kind of economy. Uh, he's working with Chris Cook, who I've interviewed before. Uh, I'll link to that in the description, as uh, well as some of the new ideas we'll be talking about here. Uh, welcome, Marcus. Hi, how are you doing, Dave? Nice to have you here. Um, I really want to talk with you about Island Power's unique approach to providing energy. Um, my first question is, uh, well, before we talk about what you're doing, yeah. what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's, what's your motivation? So, yeah, um, I think that there's quite a lot of motivations uh, behind this. And obviously the, the key one is, is climate change and energy, uh, extended the energy franchise to, to basically people who are excluded from energy or, or basically the, the utility of that energy is too expensive. So the, the only way you can actually address that problem correctly is by, by focusing on what they call the energy trilemma which is uh, an issue of uh, the cost of energy, uh, the environment and resilience. And what tends to happen if you focus on one, it usually tends to be at the neglect of the other. So for instance, if you want resilience, you will invariably have to have um, expensive energy costs. Um, if you want environmental, um, so solar panels, et cetera, you'll need additional uh, resilience in order to provide that for the grid. And then, if you want, um, if you want cheap energy costs, that's at the detriment of both uh, resilience and also uh, renewable energy. So that's the sort of like the fulcrum on which we base our, our main approach. The problem with with that approach is that it, it's 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 a it's it's the optic in which you you view it, and that that is basically determined by the fact that it's based on a market view of things. So right at the core of that is the principal cost. So what we're doing at Island Power is, is basically placing it into a completely different paradigm. So taking away the principal cost and looking more at the and focusing on resilience. So when you focus on resilience, you're not just talking about resilience and energy, but you're talking about the resilience that goes to constitute that. So that's an, um, environmental resilience, uh, economic resilience, so like some employment, et cetera. And by being able to refocus that that question, we're able to then address um, how to to basically bring forward a rapid acceleration of renewable energy. And by doing that, then you're, you're into this virtuous uh, loop of, of basically reduction of CO two, better job um, job prospects for people, etc. So tell us about Island Island Power. Give us an overview of what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we what we basically do is we are a what we like to class ourselves as as a smart energy accelerator. Um, what basically means is we identify locations. So these tend to be communities. Um, we, we're called Island Power because it's based on the principle of an islanded location. So in 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 regards to energy production, we either have grid connected or islanded energy production. So it doesn't have to be a geographical island. It can be what's called a non-interconnected zone. Um, so that could be basically a village, um, and it's not saying not too far from where you are in Stroud. Um, and what we're what we do is we look at the whole energy profile of a location. So not just the focus on on electricity, which is tends to take up the majority of the arguments uh, when it comes to uh, renewable energy. We look at basically how a a community operates um, and how it looks to to progress over over coming years. Invariably, what tends to happen both with rural villages and as well with geographical islands is the fact that they've had a, a diaspora a movement of people away from, from those locations over the last uh, 50 years. And that's 
mainly been down to the fact that there, there's no economic opportunities and the principle behind that is access to affordable energy uh, so what we do is we actually map the energy usage in the area so that's everything from heat so thermal uh, all the way through to the electrical consumption uh, then we we actually then build uh, or develop a, a a projection for what that location will require over the next 10 to 15 years if you're factoring in also telecommuting um, and and uh, mobility as well and you then can look at say uh, making locations rural locations more attractive for people to move back to and to be self-sustaining as well so what we tend how we do that then is once we've actually sort of mapped that out and and developed what we call an energy ledger, which is basically accounting for all the existing energy usage and then projecting future energy usage and what type of energy um, form that it will come into. So you mentioned before um, about bioenergy and, and the different variant uses of, of inputs. If you're in an agricultural area, you can use uh, silage and, and um, slurry in order to, to create anaerobic digestion for biomethane gas, which can then help with heating facilities. Um, you've also, if you're in a location which has got high wind or thermal capacity, you can do ground source heat pumps, etc. So there's a lot of things that you can throw into that. Um, right, so you're, and, not just, you're not just involved with wind and solar? No, 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 no. It is literally just, it, it's, it's basically trying to find the best solution for the location. So a good example is is if you go to a lot of uh, the islands um, which have, are based on tourism, they'll have quite a lot of the the, the buildings, hotels, etc., right next to the sea. Um, but what they will do is they'll be using either either hydrocarbon and energy, so gas or, or diesel, to run their um, air conditioning, or they'll also be using uh, potentially uh, solar panels and a bit of solar uh, wind. What we do instead is we say, well, if we can get rid of that electrical burden by actually introducing marine um, thermal cooling, so uh, um, that will enable you to then displace that amount of energy that you need that can be reallocated to something else, like potential for uplifting electric vehicles or or communication, telephone masts, etc. Yeah, sorry. Can I just ask a quick question: <laughs> marine thermal cooling. Yeah, so um, so uh, you've got um, uh, it's often referred to as OTEC, which is ocean uh, thermal energy conversion. Okay. Um, so there's quite quite a lot of interesting technologies out there. Naval Energies was was doing uh, a technology just off Mauritius. Uh, so Naval is a, a French uh, company, and they were they were looking at uh, uh, ocean thermal cooling. But the way you can do it also, you can utilize that. Um, for also uh, desalination plants as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where you, it gets quite uh, interesting because say for instance, and this is where you're looking at the whole energy profile. So it's not just specifically looking as I said about the electricity, it's about what constitutes an, an, an economy at its basic level. So if you've got an energy input for desalination, it's how to, how to divert that away from what would currently be the likes of use, the use of diesel for that purpose, or even, um, or even uh, basically uh, renewable energy and actually placing it offshore and then sort of feeding those um, desalinated water back into the village or location. I've, I've, I've talked with uh, Chris Cook, your business partner. Um, yeah. um, he's, 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 he's talked about uh, use credit obligations and uh, yeah, it took a while for the penny to drop for me about how world changing this idea is uh, and I actually, I, I called him and said, look, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, I, uh, I thought, I always thought your ideas were interesting, but uh, not really central. And now I've completely changed my mind. I think they're, his ideas around use credit obligations are really, really fundamental for when it comes to, you know, wider change. Uh, I've, I've built a topic introduction about use credit obligations for low impact, and I'll put a, a link to that in the description as well. Is that how you're generating the funds to install infrastructure? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so what you've got is there's two phases, which is the um, which is the the actual development phase, and the operations phase. Um, now, now, 
currently, and this, this comes back to that trilemma issue, is that a lot, the reason why you're getting this very patchy rollout when it comes to, to renewable energy systems is, is mainly because of the fact that nobody wants to pay for resilience um, because that's a cost. People want to, to, to play towards the market. So the best way of, of changing that, that um, matrix or matrix is to actually create a different model. And this is where Chris has come up with the ingenious uh, credit obligation side of things. Because the current model um, doesn't it, it is running into the buffers quite quite fast, and what, what what they tend to do when they're actually businesses when they're actually looking at doing large large scale renewable projects is they'll they'll do something which is called a levelized cost of energy for investments. So they'll get all the costs, put them in together, and make an assumption over X amount of years of what type of return they, they, they'd expect. The problem that you have is you've got an innovation curve that's going up and a return curve that's going down. So as a consequence, what the, what investors are looking to, towards doing is getting as much money out up front to mitigate any of those risks, you know, the political, economical, pestle yeah. risks. And that just really slows things down. So when you come to the local communities, rural communities, and also islands, the situation is, is that they always end up being given either expensive loans or or tied up into like very onerous agreements, swap agreements for, for their mineral, mineral resources, or even as far as um, as being in a situation where they do they get donations or grants from 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 nations. The problem is, is that there's no infrastructure or skill set there to actually maintain the equipment in, 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 once it's installed. So you're getting all these piecemeal approaches to 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 the, the problem without actually a, a cohesive sort of approach. So with the credit obligation side of things, what's ingenious about this is um, the best way or the way I like to explain it uh, to people is it's, um, it's a bit like a farmer uh, who, who decides that he wants to uh, buy an orchard, um, an apple orchard. And so what he'll do is he'll literally go to a bank and take out a loan and that loan will be uh, for a specified period of time, a specified uh, repayment amount. Um, when it comes to harvest, the, the farmer will, will then take those apples to the market. And on some occasions or some years, the, the price of those apples may go up and make him, him paying the loan down a lot easier. And on other occasions, the, the price may go down, which will make it more difficult. Now, at the same time, he, he's got a liability for, for, for that loan. Um, there is also the resilience issue. And that some years he may not be able to produce as many apples as, as he needs to. Now, uh, what he can do, and this is where the credit obligation comes into play, is that he can actually go to a local brewery um, um, say, for instance, the local uh, brewery are looking to make some scrumpy. What they can do is invest in in the orchard, uh, and they'll say, for instance, for for a hundred apples, get um, for the price of hundred apples, get a voucher for one hundred and twenty apples. So and when where does the, and where does the voucher come from? So that comes from actually uh, from from the community. So we, we and this is where we, we talk about we can talk about the structure of how we actually structure uh, these these actual communities as well. So the communities actually own their own uh, energy production, and they they print their own energy vouchers. So they have their own energy treasury. So they come from nothing really. They're just issued by the community. Yeah, yeah. So what they, in, in essence, what you're doing is you're you're projecting, you're, you're future casting the amount of energy that you'll produce over X amount of years. Yeah. Um. So, for instance, we go back to that example of the apples. You you know for sure that you're going to be able to produce X amount, roughly X amount of apples uh, with a degree of contingency on top of it. Now, the when when it comes to the uh, the, the brewer deciding to 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 employ or redeem those vouchers, um, they, they can either redeem them at, at a, when the, the price of energy is high, keep hold of them or exchange them with, an, um, with another farmer who has, has hops or whatever. So they can actually transfer the, those, um, those vouchers as, as such. But the, the key thing here is that because the community owns those vouchers and because it's digitized as well, you roughly know what your production is going to be on your energy and you also know what your energy savings are going to be. It then actually enables people to transfer those vouchers between each other. So it becomes a sort of like a, a, a very strong 
um, well, it's a, it's a currency that's basically pegged to energy in that regard. So tell me if this is right. <laughs> so for example, uh, a community group could say, right, we want to put up a wind turbine, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to, um, so that wind turbine, when it's built, will produce electricity. Uh, so uh, if we just generate these vouchers for future electricity and sell them at a discount to bring in, you know, customers, <laughs> um, you can then you it's a cheap way of getting electricity, really. You, you, you can use those vouchers to get your electricity once the wind turbine is built and producing electricity. Yeah, exactly. Is that more exactly. or less it? That's it, and that's perfectly put. And the difference with the difference with this model, as opposed to other models, is all the models have an intermediary, which is the marketplace. So they're looking to sell into the marketplace. Um, what we do is we actually distribute between the community first. So the community is the first off taker of the energy, and then anything that is spilled over can be sold onto the market. And that's the big difference. So, I mean, a prime example, if you look at Guernsey, the island of Guernsey, uh, at the moment, um, it's switching back on its um, gas generation, diesel generation, because of the fact that uh, it can't take any 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 um, energy from electricity from the, uh, the main continental grid. Um, and often what happens is that locations which actually produce renewable energies and export it, export it to a grid, and then receive it back. What we do differently is we 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 basically distribute in the microgrid first and foremost. So it's all about utility, and then we export um, any excess to to the grid thereafter. Now, where that really helps the um, the, the grids is the big problem that you've got at the moment is you've got all these large scale renewable systems that are um, that are being um, set up. So offshore wind, etc. But they're all funneled down very narrow um, connections. So uh, that's where you need to upgrade the, the actual infrastructure, energy infrastructure in the UK. And invariably, what that does is that, that puts a lot of cost onto energy consumers. Um, because, for instance, if you're a if you're a um, able to go off grid, um, you don't have to pay the standing a lot of the standing charges that a majority of other people do have to pay. Um, what we're what we're able to do is because we're creating these small microgrids, so these little microgrids are actually self-sustaining. You're not having to upgrade the, the the main grid because you're not having to allow all these different injections into the grid at different times. You can actually work with 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 national grid on dispatching any excess when it's needed. So that's where we introduce and this is the resilience element as well. So it's small scale resilience and large scale resilience. So the resilience, in, for instance, of battery system would enable you to, to service any outages for the local community. But then it will also enable it to be called on by the national grid in, in, in cases of emergency. So, so uh, would it be fair to say that um, in your ideal world, if you were the energy minister and you could have things your own way, uh, would, would it... Would en energy infrastructure be owned by communities and everyone's energy would be generated locally? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, see, it's, if you don't have a functioning energy system, you don't have a functioning economy. Uh, if, if an energy system becomes too extractive, uh, it, it, it puts the brakes on the economy and the ability for people to develop. Um, I mean, a prime example is the the potential for, for a lot of the locations to, to move. If you move away from a centralist model into, into a dispatch model, you're able to then actually train up a lot more people and different diverse skills. And you're, you're able to once again uh, repopulate locations and actually um, sort of spread your energy demand uh, throughout, throughout the country or a location, as opposed to having very strong central points. And often what tends to happen is a lot of communities also tend to be, for instance, in the Highlands or whatever, tend to be located in, in places with, with the very few people located in when, where there's a lot of energy, natural energy resources. Yeah. Um, and as a consequence, they never seem to get a, a good deal. So the best way to look at it is to consider it like oil back in the 19, like the find, finding of oil in the 1920s and 30s and the, the agreements in, uh, uh, that, that uh, were set up in, in the Middle East, which were very highly extractive agreements where the local communities didn't benefit from, from the, the, the extraction. 
The same is happening, but it's happening with renewable energy. So the ability to actually allow local communities to firstly become the primary offtaker for the energy, so they have the resilience built into their community, and then secondly, to actually benefit from the financial output of that, that resource is, uh, is, I think, a very strong argument. And so, um, sorry, I really, it sort of allows energy infrastructure to be built without incurring debt. Massively, massively. Um, and so, and, and that's the real, really interesting thing is because once you 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 build up that energy infrastructure, then you can start to, and this is where the acceleration comes into play. Because then, once you start getting the the, the low hanging fruit, you can still persist towards faster adoption. So remember before I was talking about the fact that the, the issue that most investors have is, is the, the rate of change of technology and the different types of technology it is because you're not actually tying people into to long term one type of solution, but you're actually creating a diverse solution that's addressing different problems. You're able to swap out your technology as you move along. So one of the, one of the key things here would be the energy infrastructure side of things is is the way we structure ourselves is we have partnerships with what they call uh, OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. So this is the likes of your- Original winter. equipment manufacturers. Manufacturers, yeah. And um, they're the likes of your wind turbine manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously they have costs at the moment, some production, um, production costs and all the sunken costs there, employment, et cetera. Um, but then they've got marketing costs and depreciation costs, et cetera. So they need to be able to, to get their equipment out and sell it fast. What we do is we, we provide a, an energy as a service solution. So as we, we basically you work with them as partners in, in, inside of this um, group. And what they'll do is provide their equipment in exchange for energy revenues or returns. So, so what they're doing is they're they're actually getting a long term income, uh, and it's secure in that regard. Um, now, now this is where it gets really. Yeah. Uh, this is this is this is the, the genius's the genius of Chris's plan in many ways. Um, is where where it gets really subversive is you then are are actually getting people to um, uh, they're rewarded on efficiencies and how effective they are. Uh, on, on the energy that they produce. So basically the uptime, how much renewable energy they produce. Um, that then incentivizes them to make a better quality of equipment yeah. and incentivizes them to to not have things hanging around on the shelf. Yeah. So a good example well, here, Dave is- uh, Just excuse me just for one yeah, second. Wasn't wasn't that how James Watt uh, introduced his, um, his his original steam engine into, into, into mines? It's, yeah. it's like, don't buy my engine just pay me from the you know from the the energy you save yeah 100 percent um so so the whole thing was the the the, the previous uh, pump that was being used um the new was, yeah 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 uh, was was highly inefficient yeah um, so so james watson said um if you give me a third of the coal that you save in producing uh, the energy here that instead of actually buying it then and that's it so that, that james what model is, is an excellent model um in many ways and, so it's um, a tried and tested test a tried and tested idea well, yeah and, and and the funny thing as well is that obviously it's 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 quite apt in, in the fact that you know we're heading into a a, a green revolution uh, electricity revolution and obviously the person who, who who laid the seed for it was was james watt which is which is very apt indeed but um, but I was saying with, um, oh, yeah. regards, to, yeah, uh, with regards to the um, uh, the the efficiency side of things. So if if once again they're being rewarded like James Watt was on the efficiency of their system, you're not in a situation that you've got now where large scale wind turbine manufacturers are developing for offshore a a 12.5 megawatt turbine on on a train as they would call it, which is a development train, and then starting off selling in the market an eight megawatt version of it, and then a 10 megawatt version, and then a 12.5 megawatt version, which basically gives them around about 30 years of product cycle, uh, which if you actually think about it, there's, there's X amount of gigatons being lost in, in CO2 reduction because they're not going straight to the 12.5, because they're rewarded on, on, 
on them on their on basically their sale value of the, the equipment because with, with our model they're rewarded on their efficiency it would go directly to the 12.5 megawatt turbine because they're, they're, they'll be reducing a lot of co2 emissions and they'll be, produce, be a lot more efficient in energy production yeah it's um so so yeah, so 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 I've I've been working in the sort of the environmental world for many many years, and um, the frustrating thing for me a lot of the time is that it doesn't seem to seep into working class communities. I'm from I'm from a working class community in the Midlands, and um, yeah, it doesn't seem to speak to working class communities. I mean, I've I've introduced uh, I've, I've um, interviewed one of the co-founders of the transition movement uh, on here, and uh, he he was talking to me about. Uh, uh, an introduction to transition meeting that uh, he hosted in Scotland and there were uh, a couple of working class guys from Glasgow turned up and the first thing they did was to hold hands to feel the energy in the room and he said he saw these two guys look at each other and leave and never come back and he said it just wasn't it wasn't speaking to them and when you see um, Extinction Rebe Rebellion activists on the TV a lot of the time what they tend to be doing is stopping working class people getting to work <laughs> in one way or another and like you know their message is beautiful but it doesn't reach working class communities uh but your ideas do because they they allow infrastructure to be developed without incurring this debt and to provide um electricity uh, and energy to customers uh at a, at a lower price which is which is crucial and without any altruism required it's yep. You can just rely on people's self-interest to, to make this spread if it works, which is really exciting. It's something well, that you could take, it's something that you could take into working class communities and not be scared that they're gonna, you know, say this isn't for us. It's this this requires altruism and more money than we've got. De definitely. Well, I mean, the, the key thing here is uh, well, altruism. Uh, I think uh, I ideology has a cost. Um, and and a lot of lot of uh, a lot of people, especially um, in, in working in the working class environment, don't, don't really have, or can't afford the, the expense of that that cost. So inver invariably, what happens is ideology gets inflicted on people. Um, I'm, I'm I'm a very sort of very basic sort of individual, and um, yeah, I come from a working back uh, working class community, and the, the same sort of uh, focus is is basically. Is it going to cost me? Um, and am I going to get stung in any way? Mm. And that, that's it. Anything else is, if you can address those primary issues and do it in a way which isn't patronizing or, or, or condescending, and uh, then it becomes beneficial. Now, the key thing here is it, it, this is about job creation. Mm. And it's about putting the heart back into communities, which I know that sounds a bit hokey, but um, but it is literally no, about it's getting, crucial. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is because you see you see it all too often. Uh, as, and this is where, as, uh, on my travels, um, you, you see this argument where you you go to certain islands and they'll say, well, you, you don't understand. And it's the same thing, Dave. They, they everyone says, oh, you don't understand. It's different here, um, and it's not. It's the exact same problem the world over. Um, you know, an inability to to get access to to, to jobs, an inability to get access uh, to to proper community services. Um, and and an, an inability to actually have affordable energy. So the ability, what we can do is is, is provide all of that in, there, in, in basically one one package. I mean, the way I, I explain it is, it's like a hypodermic. So we come in and we're able to go direct with with, with investments, energy solutions, and then on the back of that, also pick up with with local services and community services on on training and education. All these sort of things. I mean, um, I mean, I'm not quite sure if you read Jeremy Rifkin, um, his, his, his recent um, uh, book, uh, The Green Revolution. But his his arguments is is how how much how many jobs it will create if done correctly, um, and that's the key thing. It's it's about doing it correctly because if you if you end up with this a large centralized model, it's going to end up costing more money, and that 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 unfortunately is going to be carried by by people who can ill afford to pay for it. Um, whereas if you go for this microgrid solution, which will still enable you to provide those large scale systems, um, you, you get both the resilience, but also will, the social benefit on the back of it. It's, it blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you, 
the first time um so i i, I um for, for a couple of years i, I was i was working for a, a brilliant company um and uh and we, well, we basically in the nooks of cranny of all different types of energy industry uh, basically built around um resilience and energy um sort of uh, basically mobile energy generation and microgrids uh, and I bumped into Chris at the All Energy um, show, and I'd previously been trying to think how you could address the issue of um, of, of basically uh, refugee camps, and uh, invariably, what happens in refugee camps is they'll they'll have a small amount of power, and that will be provided for the key functions, medical tents, etc. Uh, and invariably, those those refugee camps end up with high mor morbidity rates. Because of the uh, people are using um, bush wool, uh, et cetera, in order to and and, and paraffin in order to using to, what did you say? Uh, uh, bush bush wood. Um, so the oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. And and paraffin heaters and all yeah, that. Yeah. So at the end, of, um, and I was thinking about like the ability to to actually find a different energy solution, which is backed by by an energy currency. Any anyway, uh, Chris Chris rocks up with a fully formed genius plan um at uh at um at uh all energy and uh, i was to quote jeremy jerry Maguire. he had me at hello with, with yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. love at first sight yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. yes his ideas uh they do they do take some understanding at first yeah well the, the problem with them is is they're one degree difference and that's the issue so people can't see them you know, if they were 180, it would be plain as day. But because it's one degree difference, it it, it, it becomes very hard for people to understand it. And yeah. then well, as soon as they get it, it's, it's it falls into place. And then you yeah. can't really see the world any other way. One other thing I want to ask to okay. see if I've got this right. So, for example, your future energy vouchers would be denominated in kilowatt hours. Yeah. Um, and that, so that's crucial Euros. because if if they were denominated in the national currency, they would fall in value over time, but a, but a kilowatt hour now is still a kilowatt hour in any time in the future. So they're inflation proof. Exactly, and the beauty, a beautiful, beautiful thing about this is that um, once you create a standard across it, it, it it's transferable anywhere in the world. Um, I mean, I was I was speaking to uh, the the the, the Balearic Islands, and um, the situation that they've got there is they get like um, like uh, Mallorca's prime example gets 10 million people that swamp the island in the space of four months yeah. and that has a massive effect on sewerage and, uh, and all that sort of stuff uh, but if you're a local community and you're producing your own renewable energy systems um, and you basically have an electric vehicle and you're charging that from the energy generated locally um you're not importing any hydrocarbons in which is going to have a, a cost an exchange cost in this that you're there but also the fact that um someone can come and they can hire that car and they can buy the electricity uh, by exchanging their fiat currency for the voucher so all that value goes directly straight into the community yeah um, and that's 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 where it becomes quite an accelerator for community as well yeah, there's, there's there's too much detail to you know for, for just a, a short interview like this. Do you have any written materials? Or do you have any? Is there any links that you can give to with with more information about what you're doing? Yeah, so we've got the um, uh, the website, um, which is uh, www.island-power.net. Okay. Um, so that's got uh, the the um, general information on there, and then um, what we can do is we can get over a sort of like a. A general sort of document to you if you want as well you've got one have you and would that yeah, include, just a general um, projects you've been working on and, and how far you've got and 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 you know so we're we're pretty pretty new um where we're at now we will have an announcement in in the new year uh but we'll be signing up uh an island um for uh, with one of start of many islands and um, that will be uh signing up um which one and that can't say at the moment. Oh, it's sorry okay. about that. It's fresh, yeah, fresh. Sorry, all secret squirrel and everything, but uh, <laughs> but um, it's uh, in it's in the Pacific, and um, and then that that comes on the back of a chain of islands, and then we're we're also um, in in discussion with islands uh, an island in the UK, 
and then there's uh, an island in in uh, the Caribbean as well. So it's all starting to. Do you get do you get to go on jollies to the South Pacific and the Caribbean? Well, yeah. So I, yeah, this is this is oh, where it's, I, a, it's uh, a hard, it's a hard, it's a tough job, but somebody's <laughs> got to do it. Well, I get to cut the straws and then dish them out to Chris. And all right. Know, so it's, you know. You know. You know, unfortunately, you always get to pull the, the short straw. But uh, yeah, <laughs> how is Island Power constituted? Are you are you a co-op? Are you a what? How are you set up? So, yeah, so we're we're basically a, a limited liability partnership mm-hmm. at the moment. Right. So this is just the setup phase. Um, as uh, the way way it happens is that each each of these locations. So, for instance, uh, if, when when the island. Um, when we set up on, 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 the, on the island next year, then what they will do is they'll set up as an unlimited company. And, unlimited uh, company, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is where, once again, going back to, to old technology, old legal technology and old financial technology. So you mentioned before about uh, James Watts and, and, and his, uh, his swap mechanism. And it's the same sort of thing with unlimited companies. Unlimited companies aren't really used nowadays. Um, so what we we'll we'll do is set up an unlimited company, and as a consequence, what you, you then do is you have this is this is all part of Chris's non dominion. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I've been trying to get my head around that. That, that. That's something I want to nail down and get onto the low impact side because it's really interesting. Sorry, sorry. Go on. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, what, what, at the heart of what what it's about is is basically about um, not having one person or one particular view or, or vested interest taking over of the um of, of an organization so as soon as you have shares that's what what will happen you have yeah. an aggregation of a period of time and then next thing you know you've gone from say for instance a bencom into being acquired because it because that's the natural progression yeah um uh, so, so what what this non dominium does is allows you to to have what's called a custodian. So, a custodian could be a parish councillor or a parish, you know, itself. They don't have any legal obligations, but what they do have is the right to veto. On, right. On, 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 so, so they're not. Um, so there's an ethical not, ethical oversight, something like that. Very much so. Very much so. Um, so that prevents any any one uh, interest being favoured over the other. Right. Um, then you have the then, then you have the the actual what you'd call steward, steward or operational partner, yeah. um, and and that is uh, that that would be your um, your uh, wind turbine manufacturer. It would be your service provider. So they they have financial obligations, um, and they also have a high degree of liability in regards to the fact that they put the wiring in wrong and someone. Um, gets hurt you know, there's, there's a liability issue there yeah um so you have them and then you have the the users themselves um and the users are are, are basically inside the framework as opposed to every other model where they're outside the framework so the users by by de facto of being part of the group um are actually beneficiaries of it as well and what's really interesting about this is that because they're in essence, as, as a whole entity providing energy to themselves, they're not in a situation where um, where you you'd have to get a, a, a someone like Offgem involved or anything because because obviously if you you're producing your own energy and consuming it, you're not going to be putting up the prices against your own interests. Yeah. <clears throat> right. This. I. So I mean, what's the what's the ambition how 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 far could this idea spread how how big could it be oh massive uh, uh it's uh, yeah i mean that sounds a bit woolly but um and what are the barriers really... and what are, what are the barriers to that and how can we remove well, uh, well the, the the first barrier is always um it's a psychological barrier right um and then that's that's on the consumer side of things um it's uh, it, the psychological barrier is actually being able to show people that it can work. Um, what's unique about it? And I don't keep on saying what's unique, um, but uh, wow, that's that's that's, that's, that's the that's the the apt word I think for this. <laughs> exactly. It, it's it's not it's it's a non uh, com, uh, competitive model. So your uh, on the on the current models. 
uh, the, the situation that you've got is you've got a lot of people who are, have vested interest, whether it be the distributors, uh, transmission generators, all these different, they all have vested interests in the network in one way or another. Any encroachment on that is taking business away from them and revenue. Um, but if yeah. you're a, a local, what they call district network operator, so if you're the person who, who basically runs the cables from the main grid all the way through to your house and looks after those sort of things, so the likes of SSE, Scottish Power, um, the benefit there is you can become part of what we do. And because you've already got the, the value sunk in there, you, you get a, a revenue stream from it. And because we're working together, there's a, an overall uplift. So if you do specific locations, is the ability then to move from this, what we call the Pico, which is the, you know, a village of say 200 people to, to um, uh, the micro and then to the macro, which is city, city-wide. And it's all, once again, all these interconnected little, you know, that work together. Yeah. Um, then, you, then you're into large scale renewable systems. And once you're there, and this is where it becomes uh, very interesting, is then you're, you're into excess energy production, which can be converted into other means. So whether that be um, um, development of what we what we this is what we what we basically call natural grids. So you're moving away from just the the actual grids themselves, um, the the energy grid, but encompassing all all of everything around it, right. the nature and everything that goes into it. So for instance, marine life, etc. So it's not so it's not about growing uh, giant energy companies. It's about connecting together. Lots of smaller projects into a into a federation, if you like. Uh, what uh, yeah. I've interviewed uh, somebody very interesting, Graham Mitchell, who's his his uh, his idea is um, he calls it replicate and federate. So you replicate the sort of in your case the microgrids in as many communities as possible, and that, and federate them together rather than thinking in yeah. terms of how can I build a giant energy company. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and uh, and that, and that's the key thing. Is, and this is uh, because once you, once you try and build one big entity, you, you you're all automatically going to run up against issues, and, and not forgetting the fact that what the exam question is is about how to get rid of the energy trauma and how to uh, rapidly reduce CO or uh, uh, greenhouse um, or climate change gas um, emissions. So. The, you can only do that by doing it in micro level because otherwise yeah. you, you've only got X amount of resources available, uh, financial resources. And the worst thing that you're, you're seeing at the moment is because you're seeing uh, a breakdown of, 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 of the, uh, the global sort of infrastructure, a lot of, of these islands are going to be put on the back burner when it comes to investments and the cost of investment will go through the roof. So once again, they'll be back to square one. Um, so this is a completely different way of doing that, and it's through those federations, as you mentioned. It's a, Marcus, you, you, the, the, you, you've explained that really, really well. It's, it's um, I've talked with Chris before, but often, often uh, Chris, Chris can get quite technical quite quickly <laughs> and go very, very deep, very, very quickly. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I sometimes struggle to 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 really get to the nub of what Chris is saying. But you've really You've given an overview there, which is really, really interesting. Um, okay. uh, how can people keep well? A couple of couple more questions. How uh, how do people get involved? How can they use your services or or help? Or how how can how can people yeah either become customers or investors or volunteers or anything? How can people get involved? This is uh, obviously what we're looking towards doing now. Is once we once we sign up that that island and start that that process, um, it's it's a, that will be a federation of islands as well. So we'll start off with one, but then um, in quick succession, quite a, quite a few others. Then what we'll be doing is then actually then get investments in to build the the, the sort of an improvement on the, on the website and also the technology for for the energy ledger, so the ability to account for those uh, the energy used. Uh, so what we'll be doing is looking for investments um, on, on that front, um, and then from there developing a toolkit and and all the guidance that built that is built around that toolkit on how a community can actually set up its own energy solution. And you, are you looking for sort of activist or altruistic investors, or will there be healthy returns? 
Well, the, the 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 idea behind it is to to have healthy returns. But obviously, what we wouldn't call is blended finance. So a mixture of altruism, you know, a mixture of you know um, um, sort of institutional investors, and then obviously any government um, loans or anything. I always I always see them as um, government. We want to be in a position when we're actually doing communities that those government benefits that are given to us actually add towards the the kilowatt hour. Um, so to, to what I call a kilowatt hour contribution. So if if you if you if you're making the system efficient enough, any additional grants that you get actually help to reduce the overall cost for the consumer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh... Yeah. Do you, do you have a newsletter? Do you have somehow? No, how, no, no. How can, well, it, it, no, uh, how can we keep up to? How can I keep up to speed to uh, about what uh, about developments and about how things how how things are going for you? Because so, uh, this is the, one, one of the most exciting projects I've come across for for a long time. Oh, thank you, thank you, Ailes Dave. Uh, um, so you're making me blush. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the. The, the key thing is what we'll be doing uh, in the new year is once we get the investment, then we can start getting um, developing newsletters and all those sort of things. Um, so we've just be basically been in sort of behind the scenes, working behind the scenes and uh, building up the profile with the, with the relevant islands. Um, but as soon as we get into uh, next year, we'll start issuing um, a, um, a newsletter. I mean, at the present moment in time, there's a, a form element on the, on the website. Um, so you can fill in that. And then we can um, put together, a, you know, send out an or issue some information uh, regarding that um, newsletter and everything next year. Well, I'd like to keep in touch and um, hopefully interview you again when there's uh, yeah. you know lots more news and um, you've got some projects on your belt and you've and uh, yeah, I think it's really exciting and I'd love to talk to you again uh, maybe late next year or you know in the future when when things are rolling. Oh, definitely. Oh, thanks. It's been absolutely really enjoyable. Lovely to meet you as well. Okay, I'll get this. Uh, I'll get this online, and uh, I'll let you know when it's live. And uh, hopefully, you know, if people have, have any queries, I guess you can answer them um, in the uh, in the comment section. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That would be great. It's been absolutely lovely speaking with you, Marcus. And uh, hopefully, yeah. I'll speak with you soon.